Hey guys, this is Andrew with HKN, and today we're going to be taking an inverse Laplace transform. So, in linear systems theory, we use Laplace transforms a lot when we're talking about uh, finding system responses because uh, when we have a system, for instance, where we have an input x of t, it goes through a linear system and goes through an output y of t, we know that this, as long as this system is linear, it is completely characterized by its impulse response h of t. Uh, and so we know, in fact, that the output it, y of t is equal to the input convolved with the impulse response of the system. But the problem is that the convolution integral is just not fun to do. It's, very, it's sometimes difficult and it's hard to conceptualize. Um, so we use the Laplace transform assuming initial conditions are zero, which is usually uh, a totally fine assumption to make, uh, that y of s equals x of s times h of s. So convolution in the time domain goes to multiplication in the Laplacian domain. Um, and if you divide this over, you get your input-output relation, y of s over x of s equals your Laplace transform of your impulse response, which we call the transfer function. So Laplace transforms are useful because if you just convert to this domain, uh, it's a multiplication instead of an integral, and then you can just convert back. So converting to this domain is just an integral. It's not, it's usually tabulated for you. You have a table and you can use it. But once we're in this domain, we can get some weird functions when we do this multiplication. So for instance, we can get third order polynomials over first order over third order polynomials. And these are not really standard forms that we know of. The standard forms that we know are things like uh, some constant over s plus a, uh, a constant over s plus a squared, um, and things like this, because these go to common functions um, that we have, that we're familiar with, and because they come up a lot. For instance, this one here goes to, if you take it over an inverse Laplace transform, goes to e to the negative a t times c1. Similar here, this guy, under an inverse Laplace transform, uh, the L stands for the Laplace transform, goes to c2 t e to the negative a t. So these are ones that we're familiar with, and it would be nice if we could just use these guys all the time. Unfortunately, we do end up with things like the one we're interested in today, which is uglier. So it'd be nice if we could write this as uh, some kind of form of, uh, with the ones that we're familiar with. And the way that we can do that is something that you learned in Calc 1 and Calc 2, and that's uh, partial fraction decomposition. So we're first going to take this ugly looking function up here, uh, decompose it, and then take the inverse Laplace transform because that'll be easier you'll see. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say that we want to express this um, as a sum of these guys. So the first thing we need to do is factor the denominator. So we say that this guy is actually 6s over. And so this, this function here is not very easy to factor. Uh, there's no really good way to find the roots of a, uh, of a, a degree higher than two polynomial. Um, but uh, it just so happens I know what these ones are. Uh, you usually be given what they are. So we get s plus one, or you can use some system identification tool, which will tell you. Um, it's s plus one times s plus three squared. So for anybody who can't see, that's a three. I apologize for how small that is. So now we're going to write this in our partial fraction decomposition form. And so the way that we do that 
is we take the first root, or the first multiplication on the bottom here, and say that we want it to be a over s plus 1. Then we say we want to add b over s plus 3, because that's our next root. But actually, s plus 3 is a repeated root. So because it's repeated twice, we have a b over s plus 3. So we also need a c over s plus 3 squared. Again, apologies for the smallness here. This is s plus 3. So, we want to find A's and A, B, and C such that these are equivalent. So, the way that we can do that is by equating the denominators. So, making the denominators of all of these things equal. And then equating the numerators. So, let's do that. So, if we want to make all the denominators similar over here, um, we end up with this a. So over here we have to multiply by s plus 3 squared on top and bottom. So we have to multiply by a times s squared plus 6s plus 9, which is s plus 3 squared. Then if we want to take the b term and make this guy's denominator the same as this one over here, we multiply by s plus 1 times s plus 3, or if you multiply that out, you get s squared plus 4s plus 3. And then finally, we have to do the same thing with c over here, but if we want to make this one's denominator the same as this one, we only have to multiply by s plus 1. And so now all of this is going to have this denominator. So things with common denominators, you can multiply it on both sides, and you'll end up with just the numerators being equal. So this is going to equal to 6s. So if you expand this and do all this nice, this crazy stuff, um, what you'll end up with is 6s equals a plus b times s squared plus 6a plus 4b plus c times s plus 9a plus 3b plus c, um, s to the 0, or 1. These are your constant terms. So this might look like a pain, but we're going to use, uh, there's multiple different ways that you can solve this. Uh, the way that I like to solve it is with a method called equating coefficients. And so we know that there are no s squared terms on this side. So that means that a plus b has to be 0. Otherwise we would have an s squared term. We also know that there are no constant terms over here. So that means that 9a plus 3b plus c has to also equal 0. And we also know that the coefficient of our s term over here is 6. So the coefficient over here also has to be 6. So that means that 6a plus 4b plus c has to equal to 6. And so this is a linear system of equations with three unknowns. And so you can solve this with a matrix if you know a little bit of linear algebra, which is what I'm going to do right now. So putting this into matrix form, we end up with um, my first column is going to be my A's, my second columns are going to be my B's, and my third columns are going to be my C's. And then I'm going to augment the answers onto the end that we can do Gaussian reduction to get our answer. So we end up here with uh, 6, 4, 1, 6, 4, 1, and then we have a 6 here. And then we have 9, 3, 1 equals 0. So that's the matrix representation of this system of equations. Not this system, but this system of equations. 
So um, now we're going to go about Gaussian reduction. If you don't remember Gaussian reduction, I would review that. It's very useful. Um, but basically, we can multiply any row by any constant, um, subtract any row from any other, or rearrange them in any order, and it doesn't change anything. Uh, it's still the same system. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to get a 1 and zeros in every column so that we can solve. So the first thing I'm going to do is so get rid of these middle terms here. So I'm going to subtract four times this row from here, and I'm going to subtract three times this row from here. So I'm going to just do this with erasing, uh, so it would take up too much space to rewrite the matrix every time. But I'll say what I'm doing every time. So the first thing I do is I multiply this row by four, and then subtract it from here. So four times one is four, six minus four is two. Four times one is four, four minus four is zero. That's the reason I did that. Um, four times zero is zero, one minus zero is one. And then four times zero is zero, six minus zero is zero. So that was that operation. The next operation we're gonna do is three times the top and then subtract it from this row. So we get three times one is three, nine minus three is six. Three times one is three, three minus three is zero. Again, why we did this operation is to get this zero. And then 0 minus 0 is 0. Now we want to get rid of this term here. Let's get rid of this term here. So if I just subtract this row from this row, what we get is we end up with a 4 here. Sorry. A 4 here. We end up with a 0 here. And then we're subtracting a 6 from a 0, so we end up with a minus 6. And we want a 1 here, so we're just going to divide the whole row by 1. And 6 divided by 4 is 3 halves. So that tells us here that A is minus 3 halves. Because we have a 1 and 0, so this corresponds to A plus 0B plus 0C equals minus 3. So we're going to continue on here. I can subtract this row from this row. And if I do that, this first term becomes a 0. These are 0, so these rows are not affected. And then I subtract a minus 3 halves, giving me 3 halves up top here. And because now I have 0, 1, 0, and then an answer, that tells me that B is equal to positive 3 halves, which is consistent with my first term here. Uh, I probably could have just written that down right away, but doing it with Gaussian reduction. Uh, that A plus B is indeed 0. And finally, I'm going to subtract 2 times this row from this row to get a 0 here. 0 minus 0 is 0, 1 minus 0 is 1, and then 2 times this is minus 3, and we're subtracting that here, so we end up with a positive 9 here. And that finally tells us that C is equal to 9. And you can check all these back in these equations. If you plug these back in, they all work. So what that means is that we can take these guys, and use them up here, and this equality will then hold. So I can finally write f of s is also, same f of s is up here, is also equal to minus 3 over 2 times s plus 1. Plus 3 over 2 times s plus 3. plus 9 over s plus 3 squared. So these two here, the, the original and this partial fraction expansion, are equivalent. And so if I take the inverse Laplace transform here, which is all of forms that I know, it would be the same as here. 
So let's take the inverse Laplace transform. So constants are preserved in the Laplace transformations, both forward and backwards. So if you have a constant times a function, um, the Laplace transform or the inverse Laplace transform is the constants constant times the respective transform. So we, our constant here is minus 3 halves, and then we have a 1 over s plus 1. So that gives us that f of t is going to equal to, so the first term is minus 3 over 2, e to the negative t. Because this guy here gets us plus a, where a here is 1, so we get e to the negative 1t or e to the negative t. Um, this is kind of the way that I'm doing it here is the table method where you have a table of Laplace transforms and then you relate it back. You could also do it with an integral, but it's much easier with the table, uh, especially when, you know, you don't actually have to take integrals. Um, so the next term here is plus 3 over 2 because the constant is preserved. And then similar to over here, we get e to the minus 3t. And then finally, we end up over here, plus 9, because the constant is conserved. Um, and because this is squared, we end up with t e to the minus 3t. Um, if you remember from any differential equations class you've taught, uh, or that you've, sorry, not that you've taught, that you've, um, that you've been in, um, when you have a repeated eigenvalue, which is what your poles are, uh, when you have a repeated eigenvalue, uh, you end up having to have a t e to the negative t, and that's where that comes from. Uh, so, we also need to multiply this all by the Heaviside step function, uh, because we make the assumption that the systems are causal, and that nothing starts before um, time zero. Otherwise, your system would respond before it knew there was an input coming, and that wouldn't make much sense. Um, also, it is a consequence of us being able to do this because we use the unilateral Laplace transform, which is, a, um, which is an integral from 0 to infinity of f of t e to the negative s t dt, as opposed to the bilateral Laplace transform, which takes the integral from negative infinity to infinity of f of t e to the negative s t. And in order for these to be equal, which this is the actual Laplace transform, but in order for these to be equal, which this one we can evaluate, this one we cannot evaluate for many functions, um, the function f of t has to be zero for all time before time zero. Um, so this is how you take an inverse Laplace transform, and that was all the little bits of how to do it. Um, you would do this for most inverse Laplace transforms. You, you uh, decompose it and then use the table and, or, and manipulate these into forms which you can use the table for, uh, which is the whole reason we did the partial fraction decomposition. So uh, I hope you guys learned something and have a good day.